everyone, and welcome to the first ever VC Chat podcast uh, analyst episode. Today, uh, we're going to talk about macroeconomics uh, and and its impact on investing in in private equity and venture capital in the Southeast Europe. Uh, and I'm happy to have two fantastic practitioners of 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 investing in this region with me today to actually elaborate and go deeper into this subject. So without further ado, I want to welcome Lazar Vyaklia and uh, Vladimir Pavlovich uh, to, 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 to my podcast. Thank you guys for, for coming and accepting the invite. Um, super happy to have you here and that we're going to together tackle this, this topic uh, this, uh, this day. Uh, Lazar Vyaklia is, uh, is partner at uh, Western Balkan Private Equity Fund uh, and uh, also manager at uh, consulting agency BDO. Yep. Uh, and Vladimir Pavlovich is uh, is partner at WM Equity Partners and also a partner of mine at at uh, Omorica Ventures, which is a venture capital firm based in based in Serbia. So, guys, uh, can you tell us a little bit more uh, about yourself uh, in this first round of, of questions, so we can we can deep dive into the subject? Sure. Well, uh, as you mentioned, I work both on the advising side, meaning in a big consultancy, we work with a lot of uh, corporate finance clients, and on the investing side with the investment fund, the private equity investment fund. Uh, but mostly my background has been in M&A, meaning advising clients, advising buy side or sell side. Uh, I used to work for a French family office, so we did quite a bit of acquisitions in the industrial sector, which is one of my favorite sectors. Uh, and apart from that, I've done quite a bit of work in management consulting, meaning post acquisition, what do you do next to extract value from the targets that you've acquired. So my favorite example was we acquired in quick succession, we went from three factories to nine, and then you had to consolidate that, the operations, the commercial side, the buy side, the purchasing side, I mean. So it kind of gives, uh, you know, when they say uh, uh, the proof is in the pudding. So I like that expression, and I thought it was pretty fun to actually work on the actual operations, not just the theoretical acquisitions, which, which are also fun. But uh, that's exactly also what we're trying to do with uh, Western Balkans private equity. We think that this region has a wealth of companies in that small, medium sector size that are being overlooked by most other private equity funds because of their smaller ticket range for investment. And we think that they offer a lot of upside uh, to, to investors such as us. We think that there's a lot of room to improve there in terms of operations. There's a lot of questions of succession planning. This is an overly banked, I'd say, region. So some equity investments are, could be, will be seen, I think, as a positive. So that's a, a bit about my background, I guess. Perfect. Thank you. Vladimir. Uh, hi, Milos. Thank you for the invitation. Uh, as you mentioned, my name is Vladimir Pavlovich. I have more than 20 years of uh, experience in Serbian regional financial markets. I started my career within the National Bank of Serbia on a couple of projects for the development of the legal and institutional framework for the uh, establishment of the financial markets in Serbia. First project was the basically issuing the, the FX bonds uh, that uh, started to be trading on the Belgian Stock Exchange. After that, uh, I was also part of the team who established Centre Security Depository, which was one of the main prerequisites to, to start uh, uh, active trading of the equities also on the Belgian Stock Exchange. And after that part of my career, I decided to move into the private sector. So from 2005, I was the uh, part of one regional financial group, first leading the brokerage house that, that was actively involved in a transaction of Berger Stock Exchange. And in 2007, we established the asset management company in Serbia called FEMA Invest. So we launched the first equity fund in uh, May 2007 which was a great, great period for the fundraising because it was the after of the uh, Q1 uh, where the index of the Berlin Stock Exchange doubled its value in the first quarter. So we were very successful in fundraising, but after that, uh, when the financial crisis started, we faced uh, significant problems in, in uh, allocating those funds. So uh, basically after investment of the 30 million euros in a, a Q2, and Q3 of 2007, the whole 2008 was a sell-off of the portfolio, so it was a roller coaster and very, very interesting experience in my career. Uh, at that time, we also launched the closed-end fund, 
which was much more appropriate structure for our financial markets and uh, problems with liquidity. And after 10 years of running these two funds, the same team had uh, quite different uh, performance in those two funds. One was at the 60% of initial value. This was the open-end fund, while the closed-end fund doubled the value of its investors. So, so that was the uh, great lesson, lesson learned, uh, how the, the structure can influence the, the performance of the, of the portfolio. After that, when the financial crisis uh, was evident also in Serbia, we established WM Equity Partners Consulting Company, which was uh, from 2010 to 2016-17 focused on the restructuring of the Serbian companies. Uh, we did uh, great cooperation with the local banks. Uh, we drafted more than 100 uh, UPPRs, it's basically chapter 11 restructuring processes in Serbia. And also, it was also great lessons learned uh, how if the both uh, company and the creditors are late in the restructuring process, the value of the company is significantly decreasing over the time. And a lot of the companies did not succeed to restructure its operation, went into bankruptcy. But the, the most important lessons from that period is that when you start uh, at the right time, that is, uh, you have the much better chances to survive. And finally, uh, from 2018, uh, our joint story started with uh, uh, supporting the startup companies in uh, assessing the finance uh, together with WM Equity Partners, ICT Hub, Miloš Costa and me, uh, which now is end up in, in a, a forming uh, the joint company and in the fundraising process for the Morica Ventures. So I'm glad that we have interesting topics to the, discuss today. What, what a curve, what a curve, uh, what, the, what the learning curve, uh, preferably with, with, with this. And you, you actually provided us with the great inputs for, to actually start this discussion. Um, both of you were involved with the private, uh, private companies, uh, building them up, investing in them, on all, what we like to call as fund managers on the back end of the fund, actually building the portfolio, which the, the greatest value the, the fund manager or the fund can provide to the company. Right now, uh, we are. I mean, Vlado, you, you've been you've been to the went through the, the cyclone of two thousand seven, two thousand eight uh, crisis, two thousand nine uh, Lehman Brothers, and the fallout uh, of of the the financial uh, structure there. Uh, you led two not not one but two funds uh, during that period, and you managed to actually get the returns for your investors. That's an interesting experience we're going to touch upon uh, during this, uh, this uh, talk, as well as, uh, Lazar, you, you've been the practitioner, like you said, both from advisory and from pra practical side. So we're going to deep dive. I want to hear your uh, thoughts on, on current, um, current macroeconomics. Uh, we're going to start with the broader picture, talking about macroeconomics, and then we're going to deep dive in uh, certain specifics of, of, of the environment where uh, we found ourselves at this moment as what they are fundraised for a venture capital firm and you also with your partners uh, fundraising for a private equity firm, a private equity fund, um, then we're gonna, we're gonna deep dive in, in that. But step, stepping out of this, this discussion right now, uh, everybody are talking about inflation. That, that's the main, main topic of every news portal right now because it's, it's through the roof right now. Um, most of the Western economies are panicking, even though it's eight, eight and a half percent uh, currently in, uh, measured in, in August. For Serbia, that's 12.8, uh, expecting to be 14 by the end of this, this month uh, of September. Um, but there's other indicators that we are following as, as practitioners uh, that we're gonna, we're gonna go through our conversation today. But history of this, had this, uh, let's say, environment where we, we are where right now, it, it actually goes a couple of years back. Just gonna wanna, wanna go into, into the roots of the problem, then we can discuss what, what to expect further on, because I think that's important to have in perspective on what's gonna, what's gonna come next. So in, two, in 2020, we had a uh, COVID pandemic, uh, shocked the whole world, uh, we had a lockdown, and then uh, many people uh, lost their jobs, uh, employment rates went through the roof, then, all countries, including the liberal economies, actually were scared for the population and, and social uh, social peace. So that's why they, they pumped what, they call, what we now call a COVID uh, support money, uh, which flooded the market. Uh, we didn't felt that 
at the time in 2020, sorry, feeling in 2021. At, at the same time, we had a, a good mix of, uh, of, of, of things that actually uh, blocked uh, the logistics or actually will be in, in economic, uh, what I mean, called uh, the supply, the supply side on the curve said, uh, okay, came short in fulfilling the demand. We had the logistics problems, which actually are also present at this moment. We cannot solve it uh, with the geopolitics of, of uh, Ukrainian, Ukrainian conflict uh, actually uh, shot the energy and, and oil uh, and, and fuel actually to prices up, which actually like fast forward everything uh, and double. But on the other end, we had the, I don't know if you remember the, the closure of uh, Suez Canal by for, for a week or something like that, which actually like contributed a lot to, to the logistics problem. So at this moment, I think we're on, on, on ending and ending game of, of that, that wave of crisis. Uh, it's, it's a paradox. We didn't find ourselves right now. We have a high inflation, but unemployment stays the same. The, now the Fed, a couple of months back, Fed started uh, uh, increasing the interest rates. Yeah. ECB, European Central Bank, is late on doing so, including the, the Serbian, Serbian Central Bank. They're shy on, on uh, increasing the interest rates. And um, I don't see this, that effect of the central bank fighting the inflation, even though uh, I think more it's psychological. They have the central bank saying, we're going we're gonna to hike the, the, the interest rates all the way to the end of the year, which actually affects our investors. All, all, all the story I told just now inv- uh, impacts the behavior of our investors. So what's your, what's your take on, on, on what I just said? Well, uh, very interesting to me is the supply chain issues. As I said, I love manufacturing and I have a background in that. So every company, every sector has tiers and layers of manufacturing uh, suppliers. So if you're looking at a car or an airplane, there's probably 10 or 12 different levels of tiers that suppliers use. Thousands of components. Exactly. And the fact that it is a global supply chain also added to the issue. So from our point of view as private equity investors, we see a bit of an opportunity there that there's an effective reshoring of uh, manufacturing capabilities back to core markets. And we can also see that most COVID relief bills have had a package included that'll support companies relocating production from extreme distances to more local distances, if possible, even national markets. So that gives us a bit of an opportunity here as uh, Southeastern Europe to kind of become the supply chain hub for part of Europe, for example. And we think that there's opportunity there, but that's, again, with every crisis, there's opportunities and then there's threats. But yeah, I would say that although the disruption is COVID related, uh, it's caused by COVID, its effects I don't think are that uh, close to being finished. I mean, the prices are very volatile. In fact, I think that we might even have a deflationary risk since prices have gouged up that much because of, at least for the part of it that is caused by supply chain issues, as though get solved, we might have a real deflationary kick, which is again uncertainty. Uh, and again, gives people kind of a, a harder time to plan ahead and to move ahead. Um, I consulted a company uh, for operational improvements here in, uh, in Serbia that produces uh, windows, shading systems, and things of the sort. And I remember them having real issues, and they, they purchased a lot from Turkey, a lot from China, getting those parts they had to increase prices, but they also t- took a huge hit. Uh, meaning they can't just throw all those prices over to the consumer, otherwise it might be problematic for them on the, on the sales side. So they had to kind of eat, you know, kind of give some of the pressure over there, but eat most of the pressure themselves. And I'm sure that's the case for many companies. But yeah, we're definitely looking at an inflationary environment, which is at its very core uncertainty. I would also be a little bit skeptical as to the reported inflationary numbers. They seem to be worse in everyday life than they look reported. I mean, I'm sure 12 to 14% is a fair number, but it's tends to feel maybe subjectively a bit harsher than that. And that again depends on the basket of goods that you put into your basket for to measure inflation. But uh, I think in in everyday terms or in corporate terms for companies, it might be a little bit worse than uh, even those 12 to 14 percent here locally. Yeah, I I agree. I mean, uh, we have base inflation 8.5 percent, then the the, the inflation generally is is 12.8. But yeah, Again, maybe we subjectively feel it's it's bigger because the, the salaries are not 
uh, increase. Up. Yeah, it's they're not following that 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 uh, that rise of, of, of costs of living. Yep. Um, but again, what what, what the, um, the our central bank says it's mostly the imp the, the inflation is imported from from the, the rest of the market than actually being created uh, in Serbia, which again it's a it's a different different topic to actually go into that, but. We can agree that energy is actually the, the biggest the biggest uh, problem right now with the uh, with the biggest uncertainty for the winter, especially for the in industry sector, yep. and uh, el electricity as a as a, as a, as a form of. Uh, it's an input in every business, no matter what you do, from a lawyer to a. But it's significantly uh, impacting exactly. the in industry industry sector. And speaking about the the, uh, the prices of the energy inputs, it's very important to mention that. Uh, uh, unlikely to the other uh, economies in the region where the uh, energy inputs increased more, they increased less in Serbia, uh, and which will be offset by the losses of the, our public utility companies. At the end, we are going to pay it uh, through, the, through the taxes and through the contribution to the budget. So that is also one unique situation of, of the Serbia. And, and speaking about the last, uh, let's say, decade or half of the decade, it was one really interesting situation, first seen in the history of financial markets when we have the negative interest rates uh, imposed by the Fed, the European Central yes. Bank, etc. So uh, it was really interesting situation when you have to pay someone to keep your money, which which is now changed during the, the let's say, at the half of, the, of this year. So now the, the Euribor is something about 1%. Also, this, this uh, policy was followed by the Central Bank of Serbia, where the prime rate was uh, increased from 1%, now it's 3%. So I would say that maybe this situation before was not normal or, or something that it should be normal in a long period of, of time. Now we have something which is, uh, let's say, uh, when you have uh, some money, you can earn something with your uh, money at the deposit, not much, but you can earn something not, not that you have to pay to someone else. But yet the, the interest rates are not high enough to actually compensate for the inflation. So we have like 2, 3, 5 percent interest rate and you have inflation 14, 15 percent. But it does double or triple the incentive if you go from yeah. 1 to 3, even though it does an offset, you have twice or three times as much the incentive. So even if it isn't uh, scalable to inflation, we also, I don't know if anybody thinks that this inflation will last forever. So inflation might calm down, let's say, and then you still get your 3% hypothetically, but I mean, that 3% is a basis point for other asset classes. So it immediately gives you more incentive to save in other asset classes as well. Yeah, and, and the role of the government uh, can, be, can be double in such situation. Basically, if the government, government is not pushing inflationary pressures, that's great, and maybe not to uh, overdo its, its, its uh, role and to, to increase the, the interest rate so much, then it will have the, let's say, pressure on the economy uh, more than it should in terms of lowering the, the uh, GDP growth that is also important because the, the markets can also fight the inflation on their own. When you have the inflation, uh, usually it's not uh, uh, covered uh, in a linear way by the increase of the wages, nor let's say the increase of, of the uh, price of, of the goods of, of the companies, then we have the, the, some uh, effects on the households and on the corporate sector as well. When you have the increase in interest rates, people who are paying the mortgages have less discretionary uh, a budget, also the, the price of the food and everything else increase, so they have now less money to, to, to buy something uh, 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 apart for, from some, let's say, basic commodities, and they will reduce their consumption and that will also fight the inflation. On the side of the companies, also what we saw in the last, let's say, few years after these logistic shocks, a lot of companies start to, to build their inventories and their inventories now are at, at the level which is above, let's say, 5-10 year average. Uh, during this year, uh, that turnover of the inventor, inventories was not uh, as they planned, so a lot of companies also have a lot of uh, raw materials or final goods on, on their stocks, so they are going to, to sell it in the next period of time, which 
can impose the, 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 the pressure on the prices and maybe to, to reduce the prices in the future. So also the market can fight the inflation on, on their own. It, that is correct. Um, however, that's, I'm going to re refer back to the primary interest rate you, you mentioned that it will increase the, the cost of living at, for, the, and, uh, for us as, as individuals or families. But again, that's why probably the, the central banks are really uh, shy, if I can, I can say it like that, or they're really cautious on how they're going to raise, uh, raise interest rates. They're, like hikes are 25, 50 yeah. percentage points. Um, for some, they're now proposing like complete percentage, 1% increase. Um, with, with Serbian Central Bank, that was... 75, maybe 50 percentage points uh, for Fed, and that was like 50, then 70, 75. And they are now progressing one, 125. So that's significant, significant um, change in, in, in the dynamics of you know, bringing the interest rates up. So they're really shy on how gonna, that's going to affect the, 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 the economy. That's why they, they probably announced we're going to raise interest rates at the end of the year, actually, to see how the market will behave, because market is... Is, uh, is is the trends of the market spring. are predictable, but the the impact is unpredictable. You know that if you increase rates, what will happen, but to what degree it'll happen. So you know that's I think what you're trying to say, maybe. Yeah, yeah, but it's it's more behavior, behavioral economics than actually the the hard, hardcore um, indicators numbers that we're looking at. Mm -hmm. More actually psychological than anything else. But going back to the inventory. This what you said that SMEs right now inventories have above five five year average. That's what I said. Um, but that actually contradicts what uh, Lazar said at a certain point. Uh, if the if inventory is, is big, they are above average. Why there is now the the big the big problem with the producing the final final uh, products. And logistics right now, everything is time to be on time delivery for any everything that that's being produced because the inventory, uh, the big companies, the big corporations, the industry yeah. uh, wants to lower the inventory uh, value, so they want to just get it getting in time. So that actually may be the, the contradictory point. I would say that two both things can be true at once. I mean, in a supply chain, you might have build-ups and pile-ups in certain elements of that chain. Imagine a full chain, like a, like a chain link, and some of them have disruptions, meaning because of geographical distance and there's issues in getting uh, transportation, that could be a, a breakage of the link, which kind of immediately limits the rest of it. But I would also say that if people pile up inventory, that means that in the near term, there's going to be a slowdown in output because they already have a too much inventory. So that, again, is sort of, you know, less work for people, less production, less pulling of, uh, of, of resources. That as well is uh, deflationary because you have less activity there. So I think that if you look at, uh, so what we were talking about indicators, of course, GDP, uh, interest rates are great indicators. It's good to also look at raw materials who have spiked significantly, but are now really on a downward trend. It looks crazy. So that as well is sort of a, a something we can look at before as like an early indicator of performance or what, what we can expect or what can happen. And that's why I said there seems to be sort of a, a deflationary, an aggressive deflationary risk which indicates, again, less consumption, less, uh, less willingness to buy from people, which, again, brings the stag stagflation, let's say. Yeah, that's why I said we, we, in, in European economies, we see the huge risk of stagflation, yeah. which will, no questions asked, affect us yeah. as we are exporting 80% towards the EU. That will, that will backfire to us, but yeah. with a certain delay. Can we prepare for that? But if you say the, the, the deflation is, is, is there... It depends on from what point of view. I mean, the, the companies, the average individual... From industries, from yeah. the industry perspective. I mean, we were talking earlier a little bit about an example of a good friend of ours who was CFO of an industrial company here mm -hmm. in 07 08. And uh, I remember him, we were talking yesterday about it, referencing that when he saw... He, had, he anticipated a liquidity crisis, so he went directly to his bank before it affected his company as CFO. This was a sizable company here for the local environment. And he uh, requested to sort of refinancing, refinances that they could turn around plan, kind of work with them early on to kind of avoid any, any issues down the road. Now, of course, it was a difficult time for a lot of people, 07, 08, 09. 
but he managed to weather it quite successfully by kind of looking and moving early on in that cycle. When things start hitting, getting hard and everybody rushes to kind of react, banks themselves are not very dovish. You know, they're not really helpful in some instances. They're worried about their bottom line as they should. So they might not have the same willingness to, to work with you. Uh, and on the consulting side, on the advisory side, I can see a lot of companies coming and asking for sort of a restructuring of debt on our behalf to help them with that. So that means that there is, people are feeling the pressures and the rising interest rate also affect them as well. So negative interest rates, huge, uh, cheap money, even small, medium-sized enterprises here leveraged on debt more than they necessarily should have. And then any impact on their uh, revenue immediately impacts their EBITDA, their yeah. net results. And that debt is no longer three times or four times your EBITDA, it's now 17. You know, it, and it's a quick effect at, at which point the succession of what happens next, red flags in the bank, you put in block, okay, you immediately have get pressure from them, that can quickly have a domino effect uh, on the company. So I would say companies that can anticipate this, look to kind of go on the both, you know, de-risk maybe, it's, it's, there's not enough time to de-risk and open new markets, but you can look to kind of uh, anticipate liquidity issues. So look at... We, we, we should hire that guy for our fund. We should hire that, 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 that person to actually look, look after our portfolio companies. Yeah, and it's, it's, it's very wise. And I would say even in these environments, go look at it from a private equity point of view. This is, um, you know, we might like these kinds of circumstances because it means that companies are cheaper, those are lower valuation, they're more accessible to us, you know, so that, that there might be a benefit for some people, you know, like uh, even during the COVID crisis, I remember having an, a sort of a weird situation where I was looking at a company that manufactures screws and uh, nails, how, early COVID, and I thought, how much did the COVID crisis hit you? So we had better sales than ever. I was like, everything's going down. How did you have better sales than ever? What are people doing when they're sitting at home? They're renovating, they're building, they're buying IKEA furniture or whatever. They realize that they need to do something. So they had better sales than ever. So crisis is an opportunity for some, but usually for most, it's a, it's a threat. Yeah, but you have huge sales, then you have logistics problems, and you have the, the problem then fulfilling the demand, and then actually spirals into what we have today. Yeah. But, um, but I completely agree uh, for, for the funds. And we'll now deep dive when we go took the bird's eye view of, of the crisis, we're going to slowly deep dive uh, into, the, into the, our practice of, of investing. And uh, that, that's, that's a good intro on what, we, what we're going to talk about. As, as funds, we see a huge, huge opportunity for the companies that actually go and steam ahead through, through the crisis. Uh, that's opportunity for us. Uh, I don't, that sounds rough, but I, again, uh, we're, we're the funds that actually have the capital and what we like to call dry powder actually benefit uh, from, from that can be can benefit uh, from, from the environment like this. Um, in a VC world, what we see right now, it's, it's yet again the paradox, what you, what you saw uh, with, the, with the screws. Um, uh, what, what, when you see the, the Invest Europe reports, or you follow the Bloomberg, follow the all the news portals reports that are out there, and all the on, on, on social media you can find uh, good analysis an analysis of, 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 of the situation. You see, yet again, the, the paradox uh, in the VC industry: the the number of invested uh, companies is lower than a year before, but again investment per company in absolute numbers is is bigger or greater than, than the last years. And VC funds are yet again um, very cautious in where they can, they invest. On the other hand, even though the ticket sizes are bigger, but the, the number of them is, is lower, the valuations are also lower. Mm -hmm. uh, valuations uh, of approximately 30 to 40 percent lower as well as uh, 50 to 40 Sixty percent lower on uh, on the number of invested startups or companies. Yeah, again, in absolute numbers, invested capital is is lower than than, than anticipated, but yet in in, in, in good dynamics. Um, what do you see usually with what do you would, what's your take on on that that what I like to call paradox? Well, as a general rule, uh, in uncertain time the companies, let's say both the traditional ones and startup, uh, 
should be focused more on equity sources of financing than, than on a debt. And that uh, is, is generally true because uh, more debt will increase the, the uh, likelihood of you going into the bankruptcy. Uh, I, I hope that uh, within this crisis, the uh, adjustments both in the company side and on the creditor side will be faster than in on last crisis where everything, everyone was late and not a couple of months, couple of years late, which causes a lot of businesses to go into the bankruptcy. Uh, so I, I hope that uh, on the private equity side that the banks now will invite the, not just the private equity funds, but also some strategic investors to cooperate with the companies that have in new circumstances, higher debt that they can uh, bear on, on their balance sheets. So that in that part that the company can support their equity base and survive the crisis and go further and, and faster. Also, in, in a VC world, definitely, although the devaluations are less, I also see a lot of interesting opportunities in Serbia, in the region, in, 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 in the whole world. So basically, I, I don't think that the investment process will rapidly uh, will decrease in the further. Everyone is very cautious at the beginning of the crisis and after you know that the some uh, uh, variables are resolved, I think the investment process will continue further. I expect that as well. Uh, sorry for c catching this wave. Um, right now the companies either from industry, traditional industry or technology or any any other, uh, in type of industry, um, the banks are getting strict on giving you loans, even though especially if the, for example, SMEs or uh, industry yep. are also have the credit lines and they're also in depth, they're not going to get the necessary capital in. And that's where the funds can can actually take the spotlight, well, in my perspective. Um, if the company looks for, for uh, a line of credit or look, looks for liquidity, the funds, private equity funds for industry, venture capital for uh, for um, technology, technology startups, innovative companies, uh, can be a good solution. That's why I see that this is this crisis or this time of uncertainty is actually opportunity for for the funds that are actually uh, getting 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 for on. Both. Because sorry, we were going to say, uh, but uh, th that is uh, really true, and uh, that's what I would like to underline. When it's a great opportunity to invest, usually you have the problems with the fundraising because also your investors in the funds then are concerned what will happen and they start to be more conservative and then uh, basically it is harder to, to, to fundraise and support the startups and traditional companies. That's why we are experiencing right now with our fund. Yes, yes, yes. So, so although it is harder, it's the best time to, to go for the fundraising yeah. now when the valuations are down. And that was also our experience with the two funds that I explained at the uh, intro part when we had the great fundraising with the open end fund and after that uh, the not great performance while we were fundraising it in during 2008 when the markets were falling apart uh, it was the worst time for fundraising but the people who invested then had the great performance in the future so uh, what is what is really really important to to sit with each investor to discuss its strategic asset allocation and to see is it now time to devote some part of its assets into the equity world uh, also within the certain limits, not, not to, to increase the risk of his overall performance. That, that's a perfect note. I will, I will come back to that, uh, especially with the deep dive on that. I wanted to ask that it sounds a little bit like funds are, you know, waiting for a crisis to jump on and take advantage of companies, but I would say it's a benefit for companies as well. In a situation where there's uncertainty, there's liquidity crisis, there's banks are acting the way that you said they do act, uh, having a partner with deep pockets and dry powder is invaluable. A company might have to give a, low, uh, a lower valuation at the entry, but they're also partnering up with someone with deep pockets, industry knowledge, experience, and network. So it kind of helps them uh, survive. And I think that uh, a good example of that might also be uh, here locally, Gomex. I think they got a, a US-based investment fund during the crisis, yes. and they thrived. They went from something like uh, less than 200,000 EBITDA to 7, 8 million EBITDA successfully by having an actual partner with the right skill set, experience, and so on. So I think it's a, it's, 
it's a win-win in a sense. You, you, you'll find opportunities that are cheaper maybe, but you also find uh, willing partners on, uh, as well. Again, perfect point. Thank you. Thank you both, both for that. Uh, but coming down to, to, to this, like when, when time of uncertainty is there, when the valuations are down, when the stock markets are also down, all the indexes, S&P 500, Dow, Dow Jones Industrial Index, all the, the, the technology stocks are coming down. Pre-market, post-market, you can see reds all over the place. As personally, as, as, as an investor, I see a huge opportunity there. I will take, take a hit if I invest in stock exchange in a short term, short term but in a long term, for five to 10 years, which is the, the, the perspective you should look at the, at the stock exchange, as well as the private equity investment or equity investments in general, that's the, the, t the time horizon you should look at an investment. I expect a high return on, on anything that, that, that's being invested. And this is actually what I want to underline as, as a message here. The time of uncertainty is an opportunity for, for capital placements, but you should take it strategically, as Vladimir said, uh, which will now maybe go into, into more detail how to allocate capital that's a good advice for any investor. How do you perceive the allocation of capital? How do you perceive the risk mm -hmm. factors and anything? How would you, for Vladimir, you, you started the, this, this subject. How do you, how do you, um, how would you do the, uh, your personal capital allocation, not as a financial advice, but rather than and as an example of yours? Uh, as I mentioned, it's uh, very important to, to build up your position over the time not to wait for the perfect moment to invest in one stock or an equity no market. Such, yes, no, yes. No, no one can be so smart to, to find the per perfect moment. So this is the time when you can build your position, when you uh, can uh, shift a little bit more exposure to the equities when the markets are going down, not significantly, but to play within the certain uh, limits. Uh, also, uh, if, if you keep some limits and if you are heavily invested into real estate, then basically due to the increase in the prices of the real estate, the participation of the real estate in your portfolio now is maybe above your, your uh, uh, some, some uh, risk, optimal, yeah, risk optimal appetite. Yes, risk appetite, then you can sell, sell something of that, invest in some other things. Also, increase of interest rate is a good opportunity to, to buy some fixed income securities, which will provide you with some uh, income over the period of time. So uh, asset allocation is something that should be carefully observed and also aligned within the six months to 12 months period. So, so that is the, the something which I would underline. There is no, uh, you know, unique solution that you apply and that you are finished for, for, for a long period of time. Uh, unfortunately, a lot of people are uh, working too hard uh, and they don't have a time for, for their own capital to, to be allocated. Uh, they put the money in the bank and over the one, two, three years, they see that the inflation eroded the, the value of their capital and uh, that is why, why that is the reason why we see jointly opportunity to, to support the, the individuals uh, in their uh, investment of their capital to cover the various asset classes and basically to protect their capital in all times during the crisis during the expansions so uh, with a good strategic approach you can really protect your capital and increase its value they're Thank great. you. Yeah, good point. Uh, but that's that's good point when you have Western economies talking about capital allocation, wealth management, and asset allocation. But in Serbia, I think there's it's it's lack of experience, lack of interest, a la lack of uh, financial literacy. To be able to do such a thing actually sit down see okay stock exchange how do you manage a stock portfolio how do you build it up uh what do you do how, how firstly how to get how do i find a broker because it's really strict regulations on on that from this from serbia if you're going to invest in serbia we we are using using certain brokerage house both vladimir and i and you're also active on, on stock exchange yeah. as well so you know how, how hard it can be to actually put the capital outside of Serbia in, into the other, other jurisdiction. 
Um, we found a way. It took us weeks, but we found a way legally, of course. But actually, to, there's equity investments are completely new to this to this world. I mean, uh, to this part of the world, it's not, they're not present in the '90s or before that, uh, or in some other shape or form. Even our uh, government uh, pension fund is f forbidden to actually invest uh, to into into mar liberal markets. They actually only small percentage can be invested in in the private markets. Everything else is reinvested into the, the government bonds, mm -hmm. which I found it amazing to actually learn that uh, that, that fact. But even that. That is not liberal to actually uh, invest in into our economy and earn interest and produce more capital from the pension fund that can be paid back to our, ourselves. And we actually every month pay our pension uh, p uh, pension fund. Uh, so it's I found it really difficult. And this is the the the, the, the main reason why we actually started this uh, this type of uh, episode, analyst episode. We're going to talk about more economic lessons and how to invest and actually it can be done yep. from Serbia. That's the main point uh, from, from coming from this type of episode. Yep. But how can we change? I mean, we're changing, we're educating investors as we go one by one, uh, maybe, maybe fighting the Don Quixote style uh, with, with the fundraising for our funds. But what's your, uh, what's your perspective when talking, talking to investors so far in fundraising, firstly for private equity, but I don't want to take your side because I don't want to talk uh, all the time right here uh, on venture capital and your your experience with fundraising for the previous funds. I want to hear that and how the investor actually behaved uh, in, in, in these uh, discussions. Maybe a lot of you can take it over. Sure. Um, I agree with you. There, It's a great thesis to suggest investors. First of all, you have to find a pool of investors that you can talk to. So a bunch of them, family offices, high net worth individuals, institutions that you can talk to. And at that point, you have to also kind of narrow down your approach given what their goal is. Uh, I do agree with you that the conversation should be, in, in situations like this, there are real gems to invest in. There are lower valuations. There are opportunities abounding. So you should talk to them about that. Uh, but it has been a difficult uh, environment because people are sort of scared. I mean, we've had crisis after crisis. If not COVID and lockdowns and a war in Ukraine and energy prices, everything is just going one after another. I was going to comment that, interestingly, it takes people, it seems to me, three months to get used to it. After three months, no one was anymore. The investor who pulled, out, pulled back because of the war in Ukraine got used to it. The investors who got afraid because of COVID after a couple of months got used to it. So it's like that new normal keeps happening over and over again in quicker succession as they go. But uh, yeah, I think that you should, every investor, will, at least the investors we've talked to who have a lot of money to invest that's relative to where we are from. Yep. Uh, they will keep investing, but with a different pie chart of risk allocation. So they'll keep going also into VC if they were going to VC, maybe not the same percentage of their wealth as before. So they're still going to keep investing, maybe at a smaller scale. So you really have to have a good pitch for them. You know that there's possibility to get money from them. Just be appropriate with your approach and your uh, discussion with them. So kind of give them a, a, a good reason why, a good selling point. I think this region is underrepresented, undervalued, and there's a lot of opportunity. If you look at the best... That, that is correct. Sorry for interrupting you, but I think based on uh, Invest Europe uh, research on linking on, on underfunded and underrepresented, 30, 30, 30, 0, 0.9 times underfunded compared to the rest of the Europe. And if you look at the best transactions done in Central Eastern Europe, let's say wider, yeah. their top 10 three of them are in Serbia, I think, or in this region. So that's a high, in terms of returns, each of them had four or four and a half times returns, talking about Bambi and Knjaz Milos and the likes. So it's, it, that's a good thesis, that's a good way to approach it. So there's very little money flowing this way, but some of the best deals are happening here. You can do capital arbitrage. Yeah, oh, it's, it, there's a lot of, there's difficulty, but still opportunities. And I think, uh, to get, take your example that uh, the number of transactions happening in VC have fallen, but the number of transaction values has gone up. I think that people are willing to put in risk environments and in more money in a good thing. So if you have something good, you should be able to come out on top by saying something we're giving is valuable. There's, it's diversified. It's, it's different than the rest. 
you, you will have a good chance of getting capital. So that's why I'm rooting for both of us, for your end on the VC and our end on the PE, that we'll find the right kind of partners. Because these, I mean, we're both uh, at an early stage, but this is our first vintage. I think this is your second vintage. This, a, lot, a lot of these, but it's your first vintage at a higher scale. Yeah, that's great. The investors you'll pull now, they'll follow you through the next 10 vintages probably. So it's, if it, we deliver. If we deliver, exactly. So I think it's, uh, it's also a good incentive for us to find people we're willing to kind of marry into a long-term relationship yep. and have them really work with us. And uh, we're seeing success in that end. We've had a situation where we call investors and they ask us, well, isn't there a war in the Balkans currently? And we've had others that interrupted us saying, don't pitch me. I know the Balkans is where to be. Now just tell me, are you the guys that are going to do it or not? So there's, there's a, a lot of different kind of reactions you can get. But I do think this is an opportunity if, as well. Yeah, perfect. I'll, I will come to uh, strategically looking at broader uh, perspective. If the, the, the funds, both private equity and VC are holding up on, on pulling the trigger on investment, new investments, uh, most of the, the time right now, uh, the, the number of investments is more, mostly follow on. Like you said, supporting the companies you're already in, you see the potential, you want to be there, be with them all the way through. But again, if you're holding the trigger on new investments and your investment strategy was, I want to get like 25, 30 companies in my portfolio, we want to do this and that, or, and you're holding up for a whole year, you're endangering your investment period. The fund duration is in question. Exit strategies are getting riskier and riskier and your target size, target returns will be lower. You will not get 10x. You'll probably be closer to, to, two, or two, uh, two or three x. Um, I'm, I'm concerned on how investors will react to those funds that do, do, not, do not deliver the, the returns yep. they're promised right now because they're holding for a whole period, for one year almost, holding the, 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 the cautiously pulling the triggers if they, they wanna, wanna do something. I'm concerned what's gonna happen next. Yep. And you said you, you wanna get married with, uh, with, with the investor and get him on board for first, second, third vintage or first, second, third fund. Yep. I don't know how they're gonna look at, at this asset class, which overperformed in, in the last decade. Yet again, now we're seeing a normalization of the, of, I'm, I'm just saying, underlying that my concern that uh, that might happen in the next five year, not not tomorrow, but in next next five year yeah. period. Lado, your experience with the investors. Uh, w what is the, uh, I think two, uh, main problems in, in Serbia and in the Western Balkan region. Uh, one, all these markets are fragmented and, and small. So wherever you plan to, to do in, in this financial world to establish the fund or everything else, you need uh, some certain minimum assets under the management. And uh, to, to reach at least 10 or 20 million euros of assets under management, it, will, it is very hard to, to do it in Serbia and all these Western Balkan countries. So, so that is that is the one big issue. Uh, second issue is the although the Serbia is within the Europe, it's not the part of the EU. And given the fact that we are not part of the EU, uh, we are, we do not have support of some anchor investors like uh, other countries in the regions do. And for, uh, in order to have the successful fundraising, fundraising process, it's really, really important to have some first anchor investors who will support you, and then you can build on another type of investor, institutional, high net worth individuals, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, sorry for uh, stopping you there. Uh, just for our viewers, maybe to elaborate more, what's anchor investor? Anchor investor is the invest institutional first investor who will provide you significant. Uh, contribution to your fund, like 20, 30%. So after that, when you have the first big investor, then it's much easier to go to the smaller investor that can, that can uh, contribute further in, in the fundraising process. Anchor, Anchor Investor also conducts the due, due diligence process, which is the most cost costly yes. procedure. And then everybody else actually lean upon that and trusting, uh, putting the huge trust in the, in the anchor or lead investor into the fund. Yes. Uh, the, the further complication in Serbia is the fact that traditional institutional investors such as insurance companies, pension funds, banks are not allowed to, to invest in, uh, let's say, these uh, alternative investment funds such as private equity venture capital, which makes the fundraising process even more difficult. 
And, and uh, we, I just really want to, to underline the great uh, initiative of the Serbian Innovation Fund, Serbia Ventures Program, that is really giving the support to the teams who, who, uh, who decided to, to launch VC funds in Serbia. And, and although they are uh, providing the program with up to 5 million euro investment in particular uh, VC fund, I think it will be challenging to, to collect the remaining part of the private money. Uh, and, and because of that, this part of the, the education of the high net worth individuals will be very, very important. And also, it is not easy because uh, those people do not have experience, also usually they don't have time, and also they don't have successful stories behind to, to, to see. So, like, uh, uh, with everything, when you're doing something for the first time, it will be a very challenging job, but then I hope the next round so of, of fundraising will be much easier. But yeah. yet again, we're all, we, when we started ISTH Venture in 2017, right now running, the, running for the Omorica Ventures and Western Balkan Private Equity, it's a certain point pioneering thing and doing the first time. We, we're, we're used to doing, doing some things for the first time and breaking, breaking the ice. Yeah. And uh, that is correct. Uh, Serbia Ventures, the government fund of funds, great initiative. Like, congrats to the government on, on making that move. And it, I think it's a perfect first step for us to take it to uh, take it, take building the VC ecosystem in not only Serbia, but only in, region, in, in this region, because the Serbia Ventures attracted also the foreign, yeah. foreign VCs uh, here. Um, and I think, and I think uh, that will actually provide as an introductory to actually maybe take this uh, topic of insurance uh, companies, uh, pension funds, and the pension government pension fund can also be uh, the topic of our discussion to actually free free the capital there and let it, let it flow uh, throughout our our, yeah. uh, our market. I've talked to a lot of investors from Western Europe who've asked me, okay, well, how much have you gone from local insurances and banks? They want to see local investors committed, and we can't show them that. We have to show them local high net worth individuals, which is sort of a you put yourself on your back foot because I agree people want to see an anchor investor someone serious backing you yep. but they also want to see local investors approving what your strategy is because it gives a sort of a vetting process so it is difficult without these traditional uh, availability traditional players that should be the ones that are making moves and to a very limited degree I mean in most countries their portfolio limitations in alternative investment funds is a, in percentages it's very yeah. small but that still gives the necessary kick to that industry to thrive so it is very, like I agree with you, we're, I think we're trendsetters and I'm really looking forward to a couple years down the line looking back and seeing a lot more private equity and VC companies, funds acting in this region. I think that kind of competition is, is beneficial for everyone. It's healthy. It is very healthy and it needs to happen. I mean, as we mentioned, there's definite benefits for companies to partner up with equity investors, whether VC or PE. So there's definitely upside for the, for, for the target companies, for everybody there, not to mention the returns. I mean... On average, what, three times returns on invested capital? That's over 10 years, yeah. Over 10 years. That's, out, that's amazing, right? That's something that uh, gives you an investor from that point of view, but let alone target companies, let alone market development. A bank's goal is to leverage you as far as they can look, see collateral. That is not development capital. An investor coming in in equity, he's looking to develop that company. So it's a different motive from the very start. See the potential. Exactly. So they align with you, they work with you, and then, I mean, you'll always have, in your portfolio, I'm assuming when you get launched, you'll have losers. We'll probably have losers too, but the idea is to have way more winners than losers overall when you look at the, yeah. the value. We, we, we target 20 to 25 companies. Yeah. We expect maybe 10 will not succeed. But again, those founders are really, really important to have since they will start another company uh, soon after and they have initial experience. We exactly. will definitely follow that. That's also healthy for the ecosystem as well, building the entrepreneurial spirit, the capacity. entrepreneurial capacity. Exactly. That, that's great. I mean, let alone for us that we, we take over a company, that family might either stay or not stay, but then again, they're a high net worth individual. They can feed that system again for further growth. It's an exponential return on value for every dollar that you put in a fund. It really is. Um, and I would say that uh, the changes are happening, like uh, Serbia Novira Fund of Funds is... is, is, uh, is Serbia a, Ventures. Serbia Ventures is a great uh, example of that. We're together trying to work on an asset management firm here locally that we can target local investors. That's also giving them something that they haven't had as an opportunity before. There's a lot of things happening. 
And I, I, I think on the private side it's happening, and on the government side it, it seems to be happening as well. So let's hope for uh, knock on wood, knock on wood, and hope for that it keeps going in the right direction. And, and I think this is a good timing to actually do the, the changes we're talking about, since macroeconomics, as we discuss up to this point, is opportunistic for yeah. for the capital placement, and we can do so much more if you got to ride it through, uh, through the uh, through the uh, the crisis. I, if I can call it a crisis, it's too too harsh of a word, but Yet again, a time of uncertainty. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I would just you know, like to comment on, on, on your, your statements regarding our, let's say, some potential investors from this pension scheme side. I'm not optimistic that, that uh, uh, let's say, our governmental pension scheme, which is pay as you go, will, and due to our demographic reasons, in, in some let's say, reasonable time in the future, can, can invest some, some part of the money into some, let's say, uh, in, in anything, because they will be probably in a deficit for, for a long time uh, uh, in As the future. They are. Yes, yes. But they should, they should start moving in that direction. I mean, you can see uh, in the Republic of Srpska, uh, there's a PREF, PRF mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. organization, and they, they managed uh, the, their pension fund, and they actually had investment strategy approved from the, the government saying you can invest like 2 or 3%, or two, that's 2 to 3 million euros into stock exchange and allocate maybe some pockets of, of capital for high-risk investments, also known private equity and, and venture capital. That can be done. They're producing significant mm. returns to the yes. government. Yes, yes. And I, they, similar things can happen here. Yeah. Yeah. What is also encouraging in the uh, private pension funds here in Serbia, over the last couple of years, they also start to invest on, 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 in equities on the Berger Stock Exchange. And that is really, really positive trend that it was... Uh, uh, noticed after the let's say years and years of investment just in uh, government securities and bank deposits. So those are the good trends. Also, the, the uh, life insurance companies should follow that trend. And as we are mentioning, no one is expecting significant part of their portfolio to be invested in the private capital uh, uh, companies in the private equity funds or, or uh, VC funds, but up to 1%, 2% of their portfolio is something that is not significant for them, but it will boost the, this industry in Serbia, which is supporting local SMEs and local Nazi companies. Yeah, and I agree with you completely. But I also agree with your point. It's more likely to happen in the private sector first, private pensions and so on, than the government, which is still fine. And I, fine. I mean, and then... It's usually how things go, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, but uh, I do have to say that I agree with you. The fact that we don't have traditional anchor investors here that are present in other parts of Europe, other parts of the world, is a hindrance. Uh, but uh, so that there's more work for us to do. I do have to say that our team, for example, was backed by uh, USAID in terms of we received a grant for them to help us launch a fund. And even that, they're not a traditional DFI because they're, uh, they give out grants, not investments, uh, helped us immensely when we talked to investors saying that we have someone reputable big backing us let alone imagine if that was some uh, investor class uh, DFI development finance which can, we, we, which can bring additional investors in later exactly. on and bring a, a lot of value to, to you as a fund manager exactly I, I definitely think that's true so even that you know there's a there's silver lining everywhere but I agree with you that we're uh, at, the, at the birth of something new happening and there's changes in the market that are significant but they're also very ex exciting I mean if we succeed at what we're targeting to do, just imagine what three, four years down the line that could look like. I'm very happy to see it. Yeah. Uh, also, on, on changing the note and being pioneering, uh, I just want to say the SPV deals that we do also, that no. uh, on as Don Quixote uh, going going and changing the world, uh, we're doing that, uh, Vlad and I, with uh, with the SPV deal, with uh, with, again, educating investors SPV or special purpose vehicle deal is actually uh, structure only dedicated uh, getting the capital for one single investment we're gonna do right now most of our investors were wrapping up the first SPV with 18 uh, 18 individuals who are part of it including personally Vladimir and me uh, investing in in one company that's uh, founded by uh, founders from, from Serbian descent, but located in, in Europe and in, in Germany to be exact. And super, I'm super proud of doing that and, and just building that investor base of high net worth individuals, educating. We use that as a mainly educating tool on how this asset class is behaving. Yeah. 
what metrics to look at, what's the deal size, what's, uh, what are the costs associated with, uh, with the transaction, uh, legal terms, all, all of that, you, one by one, you're going with, with the investors and going, going through, through all of those, preparing them to understand this asset class, private equity and venture capital, so they can, in next year, maybe, or in two years, be ready to understand what we're going to communicate with, with our end. Vlad, can you share your thoughts on, on, on so far on the SPV deal? Yes, the, the, the company is very interesting, the investors are very interesting, but uh, I would share also another uh, additional step that we had to make, uh, given the fact that Serbia is not a member of the EU, uh, then uh, we also have to do more paperwork. So instead of having to, to complete everything uh, online, we need to visit the notaries to translate utility bills and everything else to verify our signatures and to send everything by post in order to be eligible to, to physical copy. Yes, 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 yes. Because SPV is located uh, outside of Serbia and that's why we need to like package it and, and send it abroad. But being very enthusiastic, we succeed to, to, to manage all these issues and we are going forward to, to complete this first tranche. Yeah, the first tranche is, is being ready to be uh, wired and uh, the rest of it is being fundraised until until the end of the month or something like that. So I'm super proud of actually taking that step and changing changing a little bit more uh, for the better this, this investment environment. That, that's a good ending note and positive note, but um, just to conclude, we, we talked about all the indicators, different ones for investment. We, we shuffled the cards, uh, but bottom line is macroeconomics are pessimistic at this moment, uh, but there are signs of improvement and signs of opportunity for us as a fund manager, but also for investors that are looking to actually uh, place the capital somewhere and, and make, make the use of the capital the best possible way. Um, what would your the, the 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 message you want to send to investors right now as as a conclusion as a as an end message? What do you want to uh, communicate back? I can give one clear and very simple message. In all times during the the crisis during the, the some period of, of of enormous increase in all indicators, always. Uh, Keep mind of, of strategic asset allocation. What part of your portfolio invested in real estate? Uh, how much you invested in the global equities? Do you cover some local markets? Uh, do you do you uh, have uh, enough liquidity in, let's say, some uh, bonds that, that are very liquid, or in, in a bank account? And, and also, what part of your portfolio will uh, provide you with some, let's say, above averages? above average return like private equity and venture capital. It is additional risk, but there is definitely a certain part of portfolio that is, that is suitable for this. Yeah. I definitely agree. Um, I would say that investors of all classes have to be very patient and consistent, meaning if they already have a good idea of what they want to do, to be consistent with it. If they're investing in the stock market and the stock market drops, dollar cost averaging, slowly keep investing in the downturn, you'll get a lot of upswing afterwards. Everything passes, this too shall pass, the good, the bad, the in-between. Uh, but I would also emphasize something which is uh, don't invest in things you don't understand. Because we've had, a, you introduced me to a great potential investor and we talked about investment in the fund. And as far as I could tell, he didn't feel comfortable or understand the concept. The best advice I could give him, even to a potential investor, is maybe this isn't for you. There'll be other opportunities where we can work together, but maybe this one isn't the right one for you. And I would say people should invest in things that they understand, that they feel comfortable with, that is tangible to them. It'll save them a lot of headaches down the line. Perfect. Thank you, guys. And I'm, I'm, I'm being positive as well as, as, as much as I, I read this morning that uh, Volkswagen Group or will put Porsche uh, in the, on, on the IPO going public, which it's, it's a good sign the private markets are still active and the big group in automotive industry sees the opportunity of the of the private markets as well and since the private markets or stock exchange is directly related to the private uh, capital allocation into our our funds i'm, I'm super positive what we, what's going to come next after that ipo uh, which w will probably be one of the the biggest in, uh, in 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 the history of german auto industry 
I want to I wanna thank you for, uh, first of all, Lazar, Vladimir, thank you very much for, for, uh, for seeking and being, being the guest. And thank you for a great discussion that we had right now uh, on, on this topic. We didn't, the topic is really wide. And we didn't go into many details, but we opened, uh, I think, the key questions for, 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 for everything that we, we covered. Uh, we're probably going to get back in a certain point and discuss it uh, in, in more detail as we get more inputs. Uh, be sure you get my email on this on this matter in uh, in, in recent months. And uh, for you viewers, thank you for sticking sticking with us uh, all the way through. Um, first of all, I want I want to thank you also to our sponsors uh, of of this podcast, uh, which is Ministry of Sports and Youth of Republic of Serbia and uh, Serbia Innovates Project, funded by USAID uh, uh, here in here in Serbia, which builds a super cluster uh, in in uh, for for the Serbian ecosystem. Thank you all for for sponsoring and giving the, this uh, this podcast a boost. Well, until next time, I want to talk more about this. Thank you. <laughs>